I've had women raise their hands in my workshops and say like, how do I know I'm, I'm not delusional with this particular ask? And I'm like, what is it? You know, and, and she'll tell me and I'll say, great, explain it to me. And if she can explain it, she can ask for it. And in fact, I have yet to hear an ask that is not explainable. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dia Bondi Show, a big, huge, ginormous, enormous, gargantuan podcast for women with goals. I'm Dia Bondi, and I'm on a mission to help women ask for more and get it, resource their dreams, and have an absolute blast doing it. I'm here with my on-air producer extraordinaire, Arthur Leon Adams III, a.k.a. Baby Arthur. Hi, Baby A. Hey, Dia. How are you? I'm good. Uh, A little tired. I stayed up kind of late last night working on a video project. Oh. You know, my wife, Kat, and I, we have this music project we're working on, and we made a music video, and I actually stayed up last night, like, putting the finishing touches on it. Oh, that's fun. And we're going to release it soon, so, yeah. Oh, my gosh, that's so exciting. I love seeing you two work together. Yeah. I follow, uh, I know that you're not much up on the Instagrams, and neither am I, actually, but I do follow, I do follow Kat, and I love seeing the little duets you guys do. It's great. Yeah. So much fun. So, uh, you know, I stayed up super late, but I'm super happy that I did because I finished the video. Yeah, that's fun. I love finishing things. Finishing things is hard for me. I'm like that 80 percenter. I like I love starting stuff, but I'm tough when it comes to finishing them. I'll do all the dishes and leave one pan in the sink. Drives my husband crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, tell me about it. We shot and I edited 80 percent of this video in November. So, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. 80%, man. There's something about that mark that's so rough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, good for you. Good for you. Good job get pushing it all the way over the line. Yeah. Thanks. Just took staying up till 3 a.m. one night to finish it. Uh, what's going on with you? You know, I have a little... I'm doing good. Um, I had a little... I'm starting to have in the very back of my head, like, I want to learn something new. Like, I want to do something weird. Same thing when I, you know, when I went to auctioneering school, I guess a handful of years ago, it was the same thing. I was like, I, wanna, I think it's time I learn something weird and do something. And there's a woman that I follow who runs... Um, I don't... I can't remember what it's called, but she runs like a poetry school for grown-ups. And I'm like, I'm about this far from registering it. It's really, it's, it's, I don't, I want to like, I'm just kind of craving doing something fun and weird and out of my depth. Like that same feeling that you used, that you got when you like learned to drive, you know, Um, unless you learned to drive, you know, before you really even learned to do anything else. I mean, some of us learned to drive when we were really, really young, but I remember learned that thrill of like being in control or something brand new. I don't know. I know exactly what you're talking about. I remember when I first learned to drive and I was able to do it on my own and just, I I just can sit right in it and remember the feeling of like freedom and possibility and everything. Even when you're fighting with it in the beginning, you're like, I can figure this out. Oh wait, no, I got that one. I, I mean, I'm old enough that I learned to drive on a stick, on a stick shift. Me too. Yeah, right. I mean, there it is. And I actually had to learn how to drive on an Alfa Romeo stick shift, which hates second gear. I had to like double clutch. You know, I'm 15 and a half years old learning how to double clutch an Alfa Romeo that doesn't want to go anywhere. Anyway, um, wow, yeah. Fancy. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was not actually very fancy. A lot of cursing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just kind of getting this, this, I'm getting, I've been focusing so much on growing my business and my mission that, and that's all been really fun, but sometimes I like to step out of that and I can feel a little desire like for doing something weird and new and maybe poetry school for grownups is going to be it. I don't know. It's so scary to me, but I'm also interested. I don't know. It's like, it's in there somewhere. That's kind of what's on my mind today. That's cool. Are you a big poetry person? No, no. That's what's so embarrassing about it. I'm like, who, who am I? To, I don't know. I totally am getting that, like, who the heck are you, Dia? You're like, you know, come on. But I can feel that it would be fun and interesting. And I'd be okay to be the only, like, white lady mom type up in that, you know, up in that school. I, I think it probably takes all kinds. I would imagine. I yeah. hope. Anyway, so that's like, I'm just like, I can feel myself sort of pretending like it's not on my mind when it's totally on my mind. You know, ne- next I'm going to be hearing that you're going to, you know, want to go to like magic camp or something. 
<laughs> you know, we live in Northern California and we have so much magic camp nearby, just so you know. <laughs> well, you know, and that's one thing the listeners don't know, but like Dia kind of hates magic. <laughs> it's so true. I forgot that you knew that about me. Yeah. I'm not good at enjoying magic. Yeah. I am not, it freaks me out. And I like, I want to say, is it because I'm a control freak? And it's not like, I don't, I mean, I, I like to be, you know, the boss of things, but I don't, it just drives me nuts. It's like unnecessary suspense to me. It's just, it's just, yeah, it makes me crazy. It like my, my I'm getting dry mouth even just thinking about it. Yeah, and here I am signing up for the Penn and Teller Masterclass. <laughs> I'm like the opposite. I love magic. I literally, there's, there's a, when my kids were really little, we were at breakfast one time at a cafe in the town that my husband and I grew up in. And um, on Sundays, uh, there it's like slammed. This place is like, you know, a line out the door. And um, they ha- there's a guy that does card tricks on at least that Sunday, walking around the tables doing card tricks for tips. You know, super fun for the kids, blah, blah, blah. I literally gave him 10 bucks to go away. <laughs> I was like, here's 10 bucks. Step away from my table. Yeah. Well, you know. I know. Just it's not for not, everyone. It's not for everyone. It's definitely not for Dia. But poetry school. But poetry school, which is kind of like word magic, I guess. I don't know. Well, I can't wait to um, hear your first poem. It's going to be a slam, just so you know. So before we move on to what we're really going to get into in this episode, I want to remind everyone, as always, if you like the show, you should subscribe on your favorite podcatcher. You should rate and review and um, it'll really help the Dia Bondi show reach more people. And if you have a question that you would love to hear Dia answer about a really important ask in your life, you can call us at 341-333-2997 and leave a message and Dia might answer it on a future show. All right. So what are we doing today, baby A? So today, uh, you're going to bring us through some of the most common questions you get when you're teaching your workshops for your most powerful Ask Live. Yeah, I pulled like three that are so – no, actually, I pulled four for today's show that are like so, so common, um, and they come up – they come up over and over again, and I, I just thought they might be helpful for folks listening if these are the kinds of questions when you're shaping up um, the negotiations that you might be stepping into um, uh, to just just help accelerate you a little bit toward the courage side instead of toward the pull punches side. So I have four. You ready? Let's do it. Okay, so I've got a handful of questions here, four actually, in no particular hierarchy, but I'm going to start with this first one, which is so, so common um, in the Q&As and in the live coaching portion of my workshops and keynotes, Um, and that is, what if the ask that I'm making, that I'm about to make, the amount, whether it's a salary request or an investment or some sponsorship or mentorship from somebody who feels out of your league, et cetera, what if the ask I'm making is actually delusional? If I'm asking for, you know, in in, an, in another salary negotiation, a new company, I'm I'm saying I want double what I'm making right now. They don't know that, but I'm going to say that out loud. Am I actually being delusional, or is that a reason? Is that okay? Is it okay? How do I know I'm not completely out of this world and detached from reality? And my answer is: Look, how we feel about the asks that we make isn't always the truth about the asks that we make. You know, over the course course of my coaching career, every time I gave myself a raise, I raised my rates, I felt like, am I I detached from what's actually market? Or am I detached from some kind, am I delusional that somebody would actually, and boom, there's a new client paying me at that rate. So, we we can't always take the um, we can't always take the feelings or the messages that that ask is giving to us as absolute truth. So that's number one. Um, number two is how do you know you're um, you're delusional on this, or how do you know that you actually are uh, are making an ask that feels really big and scary and out of this world, but actually is perfectly okay? And by the way, side note, you're one hundred percent allowed to ask for whatever you want. And the 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 bit here is that if you can explain it, you can ask for it. I've had women raise their hands in my workshops and say like, "How do I know I'm I'm not delusional with this particular ask?" And I'm like, "What is it?" you know? And and she'll tell me and I'll say, "Great, explain it to me." And if she can explain it, she can ask for it. And in fact, I have yet to hear an ask that is not explainable. The moment I hear a woman explain to me her ask, her why, um, that in and of itself is wildly confidence building. 
And the explanation can be as simple as, well, I've been at this consulting rate for three years and it's, it's time, my, it, this year my rates are going up. Like it can be an explanation just that simple. If you need to tell a big, huge, robust um, story that feels like you're putting yourself on the defense, then um, it may not be necessary. If you want to test your explanation, do it. Try to try to explain it in half as many words or a third as many words and see if you can do that. And that may be actually the confidence building activity you can do to help you find the courage to actually make that ask and not preemptively lowball yourself. So that's number one. The second question I get often is, what do I do if I get a no? And there is no way ever me or anyone else can really give you that answer, but I can instead offer you another question back, which is, great question, what are you going to do? Inside of the question, what do I do if I get a no, there's a little bit of a should in there. What should I do? What's the best thing to do based on some, what, industry standard of reacting to a no? It, this, is such, this is so contextually yours. You get, to, you get to answer the question, if I get a no, what do I want to do? Do I want to quit? Do I want to stay for two more, you know, promotion cycles? Do I want to find another role inside my organization? Do I want to, um, you know, confront the the no giver? Do I want to? You have lots of choices, and you can, in fact, list them out and say, which one of these do I want? Which one makes sense for me at this moment, in this context, in this situation? And you get to choose. What's beautiful about asking the question, what do I want to do if I get a no, is that the no that you get doesn't become the thing that holds your goals hostage. You just get to look at it and say, if I get a no here, here's my plan. And now it's just a moment in time, not the thing that stops time for you. So when you, when you are looking at make a big, a, a courageous ask that you feel has a threat to get a no that can't turn into a negotiation, but it's an absolute no, or the negotiation that you're going to get back won't actually meet even your minimum requirement or your, what we think of in auctioneering as your reserve. If you have a plan of what you're going to do, you're going to have a lot more freedom and again, speaking of courage making activities, like the earlier question around, you know, if I'm, how do I know I'm asking for too much? If you can explain it, you can ask for it. That's courage making. What do I do if I get a no? If you can answer the question, what do I want to do if I get a no? And, and have a plan for that, that also can be wildly courage making. So those are the, those are the two that, that show up a lot. Question three is, how do I ask so that I don't fill in the blank? How do I ask so I don't come across as greedy, so I don't come across as too pushy, as I, so I don't come across as too bossy, so I don't come across as, come across as, come across as, you know, unappreciative, like whatever the thing, fill in the blank. This one comes up a lot. And actually, the first time I ever shared the core concepts of Project Ask Like an Auctioneer was in a 20-minute talk I gave to a group of 65 women. And when we went into Q&A, I'd never heard anybody react to the ideas ever. And it was a, you know, I've been a leadership communications coach for years, which implicitly has some asking and negotiating, you know, business requests, pitching inside of it. But not, I had never come, come at this directly from the world of like asking for more and getting it just specifically with that lens on it. Um, I had a, I, a woman raised her hand in the back and said, I love all this content. How do I ask so that I don't get seen as, and I don't even remember what the, what the thing is she filled in the blank. And I stood in front of the room and I was, I, I was like, okay, Dia, you have a choice. You can help this woman twist herself into a pretzel position, balancing on one, you know, one toe, trying to please everyone while she's also trying to advocate for herself or you can tell the truth, <laughs> which is, look, side note, sure, there's lots of storytelling techniques that you can use, and we'll explore that on this podcast to help you set up a powerful ask so that it can be as successful as possible. But that is an offensive move, not a defensive move of how do I do this thing without leaving a certain impression that we don't always have control over. The choice that I made was to tell her the truth, which is I am not here to help you be, be even more uncomfortable, to twist yourself into a position where you are so out of balance with who you are, where we're trying to accommodate everybody else's expectations of us so much, I'm done with that. 
Instead, you get to ask for what you need with authenticity, with generosity. You can ask with gratitude and courage and all the things that make you, you know, in relationship with the person that you're, the person or entity that you're making the ask of. But to expect us to constantly manage other people's impressions of of us in a way that makes it impossible for us to just speak from the heart and speak our truth is not something I want to help women do. So my answer for you is basically don't. You know, bring to your ask all of those things I mentioned, your authenticity, your gratitude, you know, the best story you can put together. But ultimately, you will be too much for some people. Those are not your people. And that is perfectly okay. If you go back to the previous question, what do I do if I get a no? Okay. Or what if I, what, what do I do if I get a no? If you have the answer to, and if I get a no or they don't like it, I've got myself a plan. And so this becomes a moment in time, not a thing that stops time. The fourth question I get a lot, which is sort of underneath all of this, which is how do I get the confidence I need to go make the ask that actually matters? And, um, this is interesting. I draw on my 20 years of leadership communications coaching where I'm helping folks, you know, find the courage to speak from the heart on stages. You know, you think about helping folks uh, tell a story in front of an audience is like, you know, you're dealing with stage fright and imposter syndrome and all the stuff that comes up when everyone's watching and listening, right? When you're the only one mic'd up and you're broadcasting your own story across an audience. Um, and that is we – Confidence is an outcome of action. It's, it can't be a prerequisite. My clients in communications want to feel confident enough to be a great speaker on stage or in front of a, a high stakes audience. And yes, I want that for, the, for them. But that comes with rehearsing. That comes with getting a powerful story together and speaking it until it feels integrated into who you are. It comes from the actions you take that produce the confidence you you think you need in order to take those actions. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, that diving board moment where you can't you can't be perfectly nervousless, you know, to to you can't expect yourself to be not scared at all to jump off that diving board f- for the first time. You have to just recognize that, oh, the fear that I have is just part of the package and I'm going to jump off of that diving board and it, when I get out of the pool, I'm going to be so thrilled that I did it and more confident on the next go round. So we have to kind of flip the script on that that We don't always, yes, we need enough confidence to do it. I get that. But it's more like we need courage and less like confidence. We need courage to act. And from that action, we produce more confidence, which rolls into the next ask that you need, which can be more courage producing, which lets you make more action, which produces more confidence. And pretty soon, you're running on the belief on the belief that if I just act, I will get the confidence I need to do it again. So it's sort of this virtuous cycle that we can put ourselves on if we let ourselves off the hook of having to have perfect, flawless, or even, you know, or even just a some amount of confidence in order to act. We can act and trust that confidence will come as an outcome. Um, and actually, I wrote, I wrote a short article about this called The Confidence Trap that we published on um, an op-ed we published on on um, Adweek 360, and I'll put the link to that on um, in the show notes as well. We call that I called it the the confidence trap. So so these four questions are the most common questions, and I imagine that maybe one of these four questions are ones that you're asking yourself as you look at the negotiations you'll be making on the behalf of your dreams right now. And um, and so here I'm just going to review really quick. If you if you're asking, how do I know that this big huge ask I'm making isn't isn't unreasonable? That I'm not being delusional. Here's, here's, here's your homework. Ask yourself, and you can write it down or tell it to a friend. If I can explain it, I can ask for it. So try to explain it, and if you can, you know you can ask for it. The second, what do I do if I get a no? Here's your homework. Answer the question, yeah, what am I going to do? And have yourself a plan. You'll have yourself more courage to make that ask. Three, How do I ask so that I don't fill in the blank, um, leave a certain impression? You're going to do your best with all of your courage, all of your authenticity, all your skillfulness, all your stories telling, all of your courage, and ultimately, you will be too much for some people. Those are not your people. So you don't have to twist yourself into a pretzel. And fourth, how do I get the confidence to make the asks that can change everything? And my answer to you is you can act first and expect that confidence will follow.
So I think, you know, <laughs> if there's one big idea that runs through all of this is that you get to want what you want and you get to ask for what you want. And I assume any question that you have, for, you know, for me around this stuff, I assume that you're coming at it with, with gratitude, not greediness, that you're coming to it with courage, that you're coming to it with empathy, that you're coming to it with purpose. And you get to want what you want and you get to ask for what you need in order to get what you want. You get to. You know, the big thing for me in, in those questions or the answers to those questions that you said that is so relatable for me is, is the, if you can explain it, you can ask for it. Like just thinking about that, just about things that I've asked for that I felt that way about, am I delusional? Or are they going to come back and laugh in my face? Because this is something that no one would ever dare ask for. And then I can just, I can explain it so easily. Yes. You know, yes. it is not unreasonable. It's totally a, a very normal and acceptable thing to ask. That's right. That's right. And even if you are, are asking for something that doesn't, that may not be acceptable, still, if you can explain it, you're allowed to ask for it. <laughs> oh, totally. Totally. I was just speaking personally <laughs> yeah, about, yeah, totally. about things I was thinking about when yep. you were saying that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right, cool. that's it. I like. Yeah, I, that was a good one. I know it's a quick one, right? Last episode and this episode are fairly quick. We just um, bolted right through those, but we're hope. I hope that. If, and what's beautiful is that if you got something that's valuable out of this, since it's so short, if you need to listen to it again, it's right here. Yeah, and on the next episode, we're gonna have a guest, right? We are. I'm so excited and kind of nervous actually, but I'm I'm yeah. really excited. Yeah, she's 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 completely awesome and is. Um, the, the conversation will not specifically be about asking so much, but it's about the infrastructure we put around ourselves so that we can um, work toward our goals and, and find the courage that we need to do that. That sounds great. I'm excited. All right, everybody. See you later. Bye. The Diabondi Show is a production of Diabondi Communications and is produced and scored by me, Arthur Leon Adams III. Please like, share, rate, and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Do you have a question for Dia about an important ask in your life? Well, you can give us a call at 341-333-2997, and maybe Dia will give you an answer on a future episode.